Well, good morning, everyone. I'd ask you if you'd bow your heads with me for a moment in prayer again. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I just thank you for all of your many blessings, for your love, for your saving grace, for Jesus our Saviour. Please be here, Lord. Give me the words to speak, the voice to say them. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, welcome to everyone who's here. Um, there are at least one or two here who I give a special welcome to. And uh, as I share today, this is, I'm not a preacher, but I will tell you my testimony of my experiences from at least one or two of them from years gone by. Um, as uh, most of you uh, would perhaps know, or maybe not, that um, in earlier life, I was a sheep and cattle farmer. And um, uh, I don't know whether there are any others here. I know there's at least one here who knows that. But um, I know it's about the life of a sheep and cattle farmer. So anyway, I have um, today, I've got my, my material on this machine. And uh, because I'm not 100% certain of it, I've also printed it out, just in case. <laughs> and even though I experienced every bit of this, uh, um, I still need uh, the notes to remind me. So um, say a prayer for me as I uh, speak to you. The year was 1967, and I was 34 years old. I was bulletproof or so it seemed. I was managing my father's farm on the other side of Titoki, up in the hill country. My dad owned a thousand acre sheep and beef farm and we also operated a beef and sheep stud. And so I need to tell you this because it, sets, it gives you the setting for what will follow. <clears throat> uh, we also operated a beef and a sheep stud. Quite a lot of work involved in that. So from the pedigree Angus cows, we would select around 50 of the best bulls and grow them on to two years of age and then sell them to other beef breeders and similarly with the Romney sheep stud. Yeah, so we had uh, 300 beef cows, um, 1,000 Romney breeding ewes and uh, everything that went along with that uh, number of uh, livestock. There was a lot of work involved in the record keeping with the two pedigree uh, breeding studs as well as the normal everyday, day-to-day -day stock management of the farm, all of which at this time was on my shoulders. As well, as, as well I was endeavouring uh, to develop my own 300-acre farm which ran right across the back of Dad's farm. This block had at one stage been a dairy farm but prior to our involvement it had been allowed to revert to scrub and regrowth uh, through mismanagement over 20 or so years. At this time I was working more than the hours of daylight there was, especially during the summer months and uh, the summer um, spring and autumn as well uh, and in my spare time I worked on my own block clearing scrub preparing ground for grass seed using my father's machinery so I was regularly working 12 to 14 hour days during spring summer and autumn and six days a week and much of that was particularly hard work digging post holes for new fencing and as this was for sheep as well as cattle, the fences were eight wire and seven battens per space uh, between the posts. Hard physical work, especially on your own. And my kids, especially Michael, as soon as he was old enough, would help me. And as I was banging the staples into the battens between the posts, he would hold the batten with a spade against it to so it hold it firm so that I could hammer the staples home. 
The particular day, which begins my story, as usual I was wait making my way on horseback over Dad's farm to reach the development block. And on the way I found a major problem, about halfway over. Everywhere we went in those days, unless one was driving a tractor, we would be on horseback. The young bulls had somehow managed to open a gate, it was most unusual, and uh, this allowed them access to a mob of cows. I immediately set about trying to get the bulls back where they belonged, but this was easier said than done. They were enjoying themselves and in no way did they want to leave. Uh, this job would have been easier or even possible with two people, preferably both experienced stockmen on horseback. But on my own, even with a very good stock horse, I was making very little progress and growing more and more angry and frustrated by the moment. I would chase one bull through the gate and chase him far enough away from the open gate to give me time to drive another beast uh, through the gate, but once I had a few through the gate, they would gang up and make a dash back through the gate, back where they wanted to be. Not a good situation when frustration and anger take control. And isn't it amazing how hindsight is a wonderful thing? I did not remember one of the very valuable lessons that my dad had taught me, and that was that if you have a job and you can't do it, then you need to stop what you're doing and think, because there is always a better and an easier way to do that job. Dad used to say there is no such word as can't, and think about it, there isn't, is there? As I said, I was getting more and more frustrated and angry, even to the point where I could feel the pressure building up in my head, and I remember thinking, I'd better stop this, or I'm going to burst a blood vessel in my brain. The very next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground with my face in the mud, and I had a hell of a headache. When I finally managed to clear my head a bit and have a look around, I saw that my horse was grazing a few metres away. The bulls were still in with the cows and uh, the cows didn't seem to be too worried either. Finally, I managed to struggle to my feet and pick up the reins of my horse and I knew that I wouldn't be fit finishing that job or any other job that day, so I went home. And I knew then that I certainly was not bulletproof. At first I thought that what had happened to me was a one-off event. But it did not, unfortunately, turn out to be the case. I subsequently experienced several of these blackouts, as I thought of them, over a period of months, fortunately mostly at night, so I was able to continue with my work on the farm and on the machinery, and uh, slowly but surely reclaiming the farm from the scrub and the regrowth native bush. In retrospect, I know that God had sent his angels to watch over me on many occasions. I know that when I came off the horse unconscious. It's a very dangerous situation to be in. Many people have lost their lives from having a foot caught in a stirrup and the horse panicking. And, uh, but the Lord protected me in so many ways and at so many different times. Later on, a, further, a little bit further down the track, 
Uh, I had the unfortunate experience to have the bulldozer roll over when I was working on it, working clearing land, and uh, as the machine went over, I thought, this is it, this is the end of my life. But when I came to, th this machine had no safety cab on it of any sort at that time, it did later, uh, and I thought that that was it. But I discovered that as I lay underneath the machine, I was still alive, and I had wriggle room, and uh, I eventually managed to to wriggle out from under that machine and go home. It's very shaken. Uh, shaken to the extent that I could hardly walk because my knees were, to use the old expression, were knocking together. And so, coming back to my medical condition that I now had, um, specialist help was required and, and the best uh, neurologist in Auckland, according to my doctor brother, finally delivered the verdict, you have epilepsy. Epilepsy? You've got to be kidding. I don't believe it. To say that I was devastated would have been a huge understatement. I was shattered, unbelieving. Now to begin to help you to understand my reaction, let me try to explain. A few years previously and prior to my marriage to Loretta, I was working on the family farm and planned to go to town in the farm truck and collect a load of farm supplies. It, th in those days, times were hard and we would always endeavour to make one trip to town instead of two if possible even if it meant some inconvenience. My mother, hospitable soul that she was, had decided that she would come with me uh, because she had agreed to have a lady come and stay with her and dad on the farm uh, for a while to recuperate from some, at that time, unknown illness. We duly collected this person and uh, moved into the truck a single cab truck, a um, seven ton truck, and as we began to move away from the, uh, the bus station, something strange began to happen. Uh, this lady um, began to convulse and to thrash about next to me in the cab of the truck. She made strange noises and began to foam at the mouth I was terrified. I had never seen anything like this before. I thought she was dying. We didn't know what to do. Mum didn't know either. Of course, I stopped the truck, and eventually and finally, after quite some time, the seizure stopped, and eventually we were able to make our way very cautiously home, and just in case it happened again. Eventually, I was told that this lady had epilepsy and that this was not an infrequent occurrence. That experience obviously coloured my small knowledge of epilepsy. And then later, I heard that this lady had died. She had had an epileptic seizure while bathing on her own and had drowned in her own bathtub. One of my doctors told me that even the Apostle Paul had epilepsy and that this was his thorn in the flesh. I don't know whether that's true or not, but he obviously thought that this would help me to accept uh, uh, the diagnosis as fact and endeavour to get on with life. My neurologist finally prescribed a medication with the least side effects, which he and I both hoped would keep my epilepsy under control. And so it did. No more seizures until some time later, after some time had gone by and life and health, health seemed perfectly normal. And so I thought, fantastic, I'm cured. 
So I discontinued taking that medication until one day in the back of a small four-seater plane sitting directly behind the pilot, admiring the view of the farmland between Whangarei and Hautu, where we lived. The view was amazing and wonderful, but I had another seizure in the back of the plane, sitting right behind the pilot. How humiliating. I came to on the back seat of my car, being driven home by somebody else. Not nice, I can assure you. However, all this time, I was pleading. I was at first pleading with God to not let this be true. And then I pleaded with God to heal me of the scourge of a thing. I begged the Lord, and I pleaded with him. I tried to bargain with the Lord. Then finally, when he did not answer those requests, I cried out to the Lord. And I was saying, Lord, why should I have to endure this thing? Lord, why me? Self-pity. A thing that I normally would abhor in someone else, yet here I was in full self-pity mode. One day after a morning on the bulldozer clearing land and continuing to ask the Lord, why me? There was no answer. Then it was lunchtime. I always took my lunch with me when I went around the farm because usually it was a full day's work. I stopped the machine, sat down under a little tree and ate my lunch as usual, which only took about 15 minutes. Normally, I would then have immediately fired up the machine and continued with my work of sweeping the crust scrub into windrows ready for burning. This day, though, I fell asleep. Most unusual for me at that time. Today I could do that without much trouble, but not then. Suddenly in my sleep, I heard the most amazing choir I had ever heard. And what I heard, Nelson and his group, as nearly as we can reconstruct it, are going to bring to us in song. Thank you, Nelson.
Thank you so much for that beautiful music. As soon as I heard the choir, I recognised what they were saying, what they were singing. I began to try and sing it with them, especially the second time they sang it. I never saw the choir, but I did see an amazing building. Then I awoke, and as I came to, I began to repeat, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I was filled with joy. And never again did I question God as to why. The joy that I felt was that the Lord, the God of the universe, would stoop down to encourage me, a stupid sinner, who dared to question him as to why, <clears throat> or why me. From that moment on, I never had any doubt that God loved me. and that Jesus died so that I could have that blessed assurance from that amazing Psalm 23, written by King David under inspiration. It seemed especially for me. I've never worried about my future again because I knew that God was in control. And I could rest in that assurance the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. <coughs> Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The place where this occurred was at least a couple of miles from any human habitation in any direction. I never for a second questioned that this experience was a direct revelation from our Heavenly Father. This is not to imply that I've lived a perfect life from then on. In fact, I've made plenty of mistakes but mostly when I neglected to ask the Lord's guidance or ignored what I knew to be, thus saith the Lord. This experience made me determined to follow Jesus and our Heavenly Father all the way to the heavenly home that I know he has prepared for us, for you and for me. I also determined to uphold the foundational truths revealed to our forefathers in the Advent movement. Whenever I'm, de I'm de um, tempted to feel despondent, those words which are burned into my brain will come to mind. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Amen. There is another psalm that means a lot to me, and I'd like to share it with you. It is Psalm 103, and I have it here in front of me, and I'll read it to you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, 
who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies with you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and, out, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like the grass. He flourishes like a flower in, of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear, fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his command, a covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the, vo the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I'd like to share with you now um, verses 3 and 4 of that, uh, that psalm from the New Living Translation. It just puts a slightly different um, complexion on the words. And uh, it, it goes like this. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. I certainly experienced all of that on that particular day, especially the tender love and mercy of the Lord once experienced, which will never be forgotten. And I trust that others who may not have experienced the love and tender mercy of the Lord will do so now and continue forever. We're now to be blessed with an item by Kerry Greenfield. Thanks, Lou.
Thanks, Kerry. That was much appreciated. Our final hymn is number 487. During the singing of that hymn, if there is anyone who would like to rededicate or dedicate their lives to the Lord, if you would like to come down the front, I'd like to have a little prayer with you. Let's sing together in the garden.
our Father in heaven, our Lord, our God. We thank you that you love us so much that you revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. I just pray, Lord, that you'll be here in the hearts of each and every one of us today and every day until you come. We thank you for that blessed assurance that we shall dwell in your house forever and ever.